of our Center for Teaching and Learning, which means that it is my extraordinary privilege um, to be able to work with faculty on uh, making sure that our teaching is always uh, improving, is always engaging, is always inclusive, um, always exciting, and hopefully also always fun uh, for us as faculty members. Um, we know that you all have a lot of questions, so we're gonna spend most of today getting questions from you all. Um, and, uh, but before we do that, I wanted to give my fellow panelists the chance to introduce themselves uh, and tell you a little bit about what they value about teaching here, um, and especially what they value about teaching your students um, who are joining us uh, for this new academic year. Um, so if you all wouldn't mind introducing yourselves. Uh, Angelica, do you wanna get us started? Sure, uh, yeah. My name is Angelica Osorno. I'm a professor in the math department. Um, and one of the things that I really, really enjoy about teaching here at Reed is that students are curious. They just want to know. They're very engaged. And for me, that means different things depending on the class that I'm teaching. Sometimes I mostly lecture, and when I'm lecturing, students have questions all the time, and that means that I don't get through all the material that I wanted, but I know that we're getting through it uh, very well. But I also sometimes teach classes where we flip things around and we mostly do classwork uh, when we're together. And in that setting, I, I see students really trying to get serious with their problem solving, talking to each other, and really engaging in the material. And overall, this is what I see with our students, that they really, really want to engage thoroughly with the material and want to learn it best. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Shohei Kobayashi. Um, I'm an assistant professor in the music department. Um, I'd say one thing I value about the Reed classroom, <clears throat> about the students in particular, um, is that they, uh, they want to, they desire to challenge and to be challenged. So um, I would say as like a, a junior faculty member, I just started in 2020, um, and as somebody in performance, so a little bit less experienced in teaching in the classroom in particular, my classroom is the rehearsal hall or whatever, um, so my classroom teaching I feel like has improved like miles <laughs> because students not only you know ask wonderful questions as Anelika mentioned, um, but they also provide such thoughtful feedback in the course evaluations. They really engage like with the material as mentioned, but also just with the process of learning in this way that um, holds us accountable as faculty and has al allowed us um, and through Mary's programs to, to, to transform our own practice over time with them. So. Hi everybody, I'm Margaret Charlie, and I teach in the philosophy department as well as teaching in the Humanities 110 program. Uh, so welcome today and I'm excited to talk with you about uh, the Reed classroom experience and something that I really value is the really dynamic, fresh, organic kind of conversations we can have in the classroom. So even when I teach materials a second time, it's never the same because I have different students with different interests. And I always begin each class with those student interests. And my role really is to kind of shape the discussion. And then as the semester or the year, as it is in Humanities 110, I, I do less and less and they do more and more. And it's kind of a marvel every year how they start shaping the discussions and weaving together everybody's comments. I guess what you could think of a classroom um, experience at Reed is to write a shared paper. What paper can we write orally together in community about this material we've just read? And um, it's always exciting and I enjoy it kind of creating those kind of intellectual spaces where we write a collaborative paper every class. Um, thanks everyone and I love Meg that image of the collective paper because I will say one of the things I really value about not only the classroom but the arc of the education at Reed is that we start with that collective paper and our students will end with this individualized paper which is the thesis project um, and so I think that's a really nice way of thinking about what happens from the beginning to what happens uh, as a culminating moment um, before I open the floor I did have one other question for our panelists uh, and it's essentially about this moment um, and being a student and a faculty member uh, in this moment and in these times. Um, we continue to live in times with 
challenges. Uh, you know, we're all here in masks. That would not have been the case a couple of years ago. Uh, many of us experienced teaching online. All of your students, I'm sure, experienced being students online. Um, and so I would just love to hear you all think a little bit with us about what you see as some of the key challenges, but also key opportunities of teaching in this moment, and what steps you all might take this year to make sure that your classroom feels as inclusive and welcoming as possible to our students. Um, Meg, do you mind getting started with this one? Sure. Um, so something that I like to do at the beginning of the year to kind of generate a kind of community of inclusion is to invite each student to say, here's something that I think I can contribute to the class, and here's something I want help with. So, so there are sometimes students that, who say, I'm actually kind of quiet in class, and I kind of like it when other students call on me. And so I've actually had them articulate that at the beginning and then have other students draw them out so that each person is really kind of from the beginning seeing what are the things that I can contribute and what are the kind of things I need help with. And that help comes not only from me, but also from their fellow students. And I think everybody's yearning for community, and I think that's what really makes a difference. If we can trust each other and generate those kind of bonds in a classroom, anything's possible. I'll go next. Um, so yeah, as far as challenges, I think uh, it's broad and uh, direct enough to say that like, we can end up combating some cynicism, some despair at some point along our journeys here throughout the academic year, and it feels like each academic year brings something new, whether it's internally in the institution or something external um, that's really deeply affecting our students and making them realize things about their experiences here. Um, so, that's a big challenge that I feel like even as, a, as a, a, a young faculty, I'm still figuring out how everybody just keeps going on. I, I, I really don't know sometimes, <laughs> and I'm impressed by my senior colleagues um, in these moments often. Um, so as far as opportunities go, I feel like as uh, director of choirs here at Reed and um, teaching classes involved with music theory and musicianship, that I, get, I have this opportunity to center art making as a practice to carve out time for yourself and for creative community. That you know, we get to carve out time for balance. That we get to make things together and make things happen together. And in a world where it feels like we can't do anything, <laughs> um, uh, to actually do something and make something together with, your, with our peers. Um, as a team, as collaborators, I think this is a really special thing. Um, as far as fostering inclusive and <laughs> rigorous intellectual engagement, I kind of have these two zones of um, my classroom. Uh, so my theory classes, my musicianship classes. One way I try to make this inclusive is by in incorporating student taste, um, students' musical taste. So, I do these like class playlists and I have students contribute all of their favorite tunes or I might have some kind of um, prompt like, you know, what, would, what music would you put on if it's raining outside? And um, I incorporate all these things as a way for students to feel seen in the curriculum, but not in like a superficial way, right? Like, like I don't necessarily want to only see an, like an Asian artist um, in my curriculum just because I'm Asian. It feels like a very sort of surface level kind of idea of inclusion. Um, in my uh, choral rehearsals, um, in terms of like a sort of intellectual rigor, I like to think about sort of participatory rigor. Um, so how are my rehearsals democratic in a certain way? Can I ask the students questions of the score that we're preparing together um, that allow them to be part of the decision-making processes? Because a lot of large ensemble music making can be dictatorial in a way, top-down in a certain way. So figuring out how the students are sort of engaged um, in the music making decisions along the way too is a way that I try to, um, yeah, embody some rigor in our process. Um, so when I was thinking about this question, we got this question ahead of time. Um, one, of, one of the things about this moment that, that 
uh, I mean, I think a lot of us uh, faculty members back in March of 2020, we were like, had this fear of like, are we still relevant, right? Like if everything is moving online, what is the model that we offer here at Reed and why is it still viable when like you could just go online, right? And, and, and go and watch a lecture at, uh, provided by, by another, a different place. And one way in which I approach this in my mathematics classroom is by working with students when we're together, not just lecturing. And that takes different forms depending on the class that I'm teaching. But for example, this semester I'm teaching a class called Math 113, Discrete Structures. And students are learning how to problem solve using rigorous mathematics at this point. So they're starting to learn how to prove things. And that's very challenging for students. And before the pandemic, I would just maybe lecture and then, and then, and then maybe with some, some uh, interaction with students. But that's not how we learn how to solve things. We learn by doing. And the doing before was in the homework, but now the doing is happening in the classroom. And one of the things that I'm doing is using the tools that we learned during the pandemic. It, I produce videos that students watch ahead of time. That's the, my lecturing happens not in the classroom. And then in the classroom, we actually work together and we learn from each other. And this is part of like also the inclusive way of thinking that students just don't learn. I, most students don't learn from, from lecturing. They learn from doing and they learn from doing with each other. And so my classroom is set up with group work, the groups change around, and it's all centered around listening to each other and listening to each other's ideas. And this is mixing both the inclusiveness and the rigorous in the, at the same time, because we are learning how to do rigorous mathematics as part of this process. Um, thank you, and I love this last example. I think one of the things that really became clear to me, especially last year, last year was my first uh, year in this role as the director for Center of the Center for Teaching and Learning, was how much we all learned as teachers in the last three years. And I think um, we had to flex new muscles, we had to learn new skills, we learned new tools, new techniques. Um, and I 100% fully believe that each one of us is a better teacher for your students today than we would have been had they arrived in, in 2018. Um, and for me, that's been really exciting to think about how I can continue to help us develop those, those, new, school, those new skills, even though I hope, Shohei, you never again have to conduct the chorus online, <laughs> um, which was a particular challenge. Um, with that, I'll open the floor for questions, and we have, um, a mic, a couple of mics around. If anyone has a question, just go on and raise your hand. Is that one in the back? Colby, there's one back here. Hi. Um, my child was told that um, the class selection for freshmen has changed this year. So I'm wondering if you could explain about um, what that might be and if there's a guarantee of a full class load this year um, and the diversity of classes that are offered to freshmen. Um, I actually, before you put down the microphone, I, I missed the, just the first part of your question. Could you repeat it, please? Um, my, my daughter or my child was told that the class selection for freshmen had changed this year. So I was wondering if you could explain what that process is, um, if they would, if they're guaranteed a full class load, and um, how many variety of classes that freshmen can choose from. Um, thanks, great question. Uh, there has been one change to how students enroll, um, and it's essentially trying to give all of our first year students equal opportunity to get into the class that they most hope to have. So they will have one hour, a dibs hour on Thursday um, in which they get to sign up for one class each semester that's their top priority before registration opens for the rest of their classes. So that's the only technical change that's taken place. Um, I will say, and I'll let uh, the rest of the panel chime in here as well, um, there is a fair, there's often a sort of structured curriculum, especially in the, the first year, in large part because Hume 110 is a requirement for all of our students, and that is a year-long course, and it's one and a half units uh, each semester. Um, so that occupies a fair amount of, of space. 
Um, that said, there's a tremendous amount of, of wiggle room, and I wonder, um, as we think through this, uh, if you all might talk about some of the classes that are available to first years, either that, that you're teaching um, or that some of your colleagues are teaching. Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll get started. And maybe first I'll, I'll say, so most first year students uh, will be taking three and a half units in the fall and possibly three and a half units in the spring. So that means that they're doing Hume 110 and then two other classes. And there is plenty of room for every student to take two other classes. There is a question of whether they will be able to enroll in the two classes they want the most. Um, and let me just tell you from, from the math department at uh, Vantage Point, which is the one that I know the best, uh, because our classes are actually required for so many different majors, we will make sure that there is room for any student who wants to take any of our mathematics classes. That's not true for statistics because those are elective, but for mathematics classes. Um, since you ask about which classes I'm, uh, we're teaching in the math department, so there's calculus and this discrete math class. Those are the two classes that we have that don't have any prereqs, so a student with high school uh, math can get into those. And then we have other classes that if you place out of calculus, you can, you can get into. And as I said, we, we have plenty of room for any first year student who wants to uh, enroll in, in any of those. Yeah, one of the um, mechanisms that faculty can um, apply to their classes that are um, popular, that are often waitlisted or whatever, um, is to block a certain number of seats for first years. So for example, this <clears throat> Music 110 course that I teach, which is like a kind of fundamentals of uh, uh, music notation and uh, music theory, um, just this year we've started to um, block a number of seats for first years um, who you know, maybe want to pursue a music major or whatever. Um, I do think Angelica's point about um, reducing the load for first years is a, is a key point. Um, part of that is to allow the students to acclimate um, to um, a certain level of expectations at college and also to just get used to being at this place while also taking classes and everything. Um, yeah, Meg, would you add anything? Oh yeah, so we, we, in the philosophy department, we also block courses uh, for first year students and we offer you know, a pretty good range of courses um, in our department. So, and I'm happy to answer any particular questions that, you know, either now or later about philosophy in particular, but yeah. Thank you. Um, I know from when I transitioned from um, high school to college, um, we, we've sort of been talking around this a little bit, right, of, of, of what's what's a reasonable load for, for uh, an incoming freshman? So I'd just like to ask it explicitly, right? What, what are your expectations for what, what, what load should a, an incoming freshman have, given that, yes, there's a whole bunch of acclimation, you know, there's a bunch of other stuff to do as part of transitioning to college life? Mm hmm. Hmm. <laughs> so, um, I mean, it partly just depends on the student, I feel like. And, and to be honest, I feel like I'm still acclimating myself to what the expectation is for any student here. Um, it, I do think, like, Hume 110, for example, uh, the kind of um, analysis of text they're doing in that class is on a level that, like, I didn't really encounter in undergrad. I feel like there's a lot of ways that Reed students are expected to do almost graduate level work in this undergraduate sort of institution. I don't know if that starts at the first year, um, but I feel like they start to get a taste of it. And, and that's kind of why the, the load is a little bit lower, it seems. But that's honestly my inexperienced um, say, so I'll pass it over. <laughs> and I mean, to put a number on it, usually students take three and a half uh, units the first semester and um, the four and a half the second semester. And the Hume 110 course is one and a half units because it's writing intensive. So after every paper, they meet with the professor. Um, they not only get written comments, but they get oral comments on all of their work. And the course also has both a lecture component and um, you know, a, conf a conference class component. And so given that those extra elements to it, that's why it's one and a half units. Um, but that's standardly what a first year student takes. And now there are some students who want to take a fourth class their first semester and, you know, 
that's dependent on the circumstance. What, you know, what sort of courses are they taking? You know, are they kind of a range of modalities that make more sense or what have you? But that's usually discerned on a, a case by case basis in conversation with the student what we would recommend. This, this is kind of a follow-up question, and it's really more for science and pre-health students, and I know that they have their own advisors and stuff, but I'm curious, as our son has looked towards the classes, and he's seen that advice, but that doesn't seem to match entirely, so it's, it's, it's kind of the same kind of question, what is, what is too much load? Because when you look at pre-health pathways, then you have le you know, science labs, chemistry, bio, chemistry, math, statistics, all that have to fit into four years. Is there a particular place other than his advisor and pre-health that he can go and sort of reconcile this in terms of what a reasonable load is? Because of course every, every kid thinks, oh, I can do that. So um, all of your students will meet with their first year advisor on Thursday, and this is a great place to have this conversation. Um, all majors have a, a suggested course path for your first two years in an advisor handbook um, that's also available to students through major planners. Um, so if your student, if, I can give you the websites afterwards if, if you're interested, um, your, their, your student's advisor will also have access to this information. Um, I will say, I think uh, my recommendation always to students is to take three courses each semester, and if they feel like they're really thriving partway through the fall semester, they can add a fourth for the spring. Um, you need 30 credits to graduate here. That means if you take three classes each semester in, the, um, in your first year, you need to take four each semester from there on. That's totally doable. Um, so I think, you know, there's, I would much rather see a student take the time to get acclimated to life here mm -hmm find hobbies, sign up for some PE classes, learn a little bit about Portland, make sure they have a good, strong social network in that first year, and then have a slightly more challenging second, third, and even fourth year. I don't know if there's anything else any of you all would add. No, I mean, I think, I think it's, for me, it's always, whenever I'm having a conversation with my first year advisees, I always stress that, that, and I mean, we, many of our students are overachievers, and, that's partly why they're here. Uh, but a load in college is different and, and the first year is different and you're getting used to a new life and so on. So there's no rush, right? And everything is planned out. Whatever your major is, you can do it by taking 3.5 units each, each semester of your first year. And, and, and I do have those conversations with students. Students who are doing well the first, the first semester, we can talk about going to 4.5. Uh, the second semester, but but I try to discourage uh, doing too much too soon. Thank you. Um, I have kind of two questions, but the first one is a follow up. I'm more familiar with like the 12, 15, 18 unit kind of thing. So uh, like for financial aid, federal work study, that sort of thing. Is three units here then considered full time? three is the minimum, and would five be the max? Sort of, do you know what I'm asking? Does that kind of translate to the 12 to 18 range? Yes. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, and then secondly, I wanted to ask, following up about the advisors. I know they all get a first year advisor for the scheduling this week. Is that, uh, I want, so kind of two questions. Does that advisor come from their tentative departments or does it come from a second like advising place on campus? Secondly, do they keep that same advisor for the four years? And then, and then additionally, if it's not from their department, do they also get an additional um, department advisor? Sorry, I know it's kind of a lot. I, I can go ahead. Uh, so ideally, the student will get an advisor from the department that they're planning, that they said they're planning to major in. Um, although some students are undecided, and some departments just don't have the bandwidth to have every, every single student uh, uh, to do that. Uh, so, so for example, this year, uh, mathematics students, or students who have said that they're interested in mathematics, are mostly getting advisors from other departments, but they're advisors who have been trained by professors in the math department about what it's like to be um, a math student. 
uh, students don't necessarily keep their advisors there the four years, but they might. Uh, and things that might change that are, well, if you switch majors, at some point you should get an advisor in the major that you're in. Uh, people go on sabbatical and leave all the time, so whenever I go on sabbatical, I lose all of my advisees, uh, and then some of them c come back. Uh, but there are students who, who do have the same advisor all four years, and maybe I should add, sometimes like there's just no, no good chemistry between the, the student and the advisor, and that's fine. And the student can request a change of advisor via either talking to another potential advisor, and you just do that and that, that it's really easy to change advisors that way or they can go to the registrar's office and say, I just want a new assignment and, and that happens. So there's one last thing. So advisors are faculty. Yes. It's not a separate thing. Every student gets a, a faculty member who's the, their advisor. Yeah. I, if I might just follow up on that. Yeah. I, I know psychology, for example, is a department that has a, a lot of interested students right now. And so um, many faculty across many departments are taking on students that are interested in psychology that declared a psychology major. That's not like an arbitrary just sending off of the students though. Um, I've been pleasantly surprised by that. For example, two new advisors that I have that are interested in psychology have uh, also both stated in their sort of questionnaires and stuff that they're interested in music, that they're maybe um, uh, either interested in performing or just want to continue in some way and maybe want to integrate those things in some way. And so then I have the opportunity to say, oh, like maybe if you're interested, I can connect you with my music therapist friends. And so it's not like um, they're just sent off willy-nilly. They really do take into consideration um, how a faculty pairing could um, work well and still be part of their interests. Uh, thank you. Um, one question I had was about the sports and the um, activities, the, you know, which I know it's good to encourage physical activity. So when we looked on it, it, it looked like sports, you signed up for it, like a club, but then it doesn't really count. I, I guess my question is, when you sign up for the three and a half, is that including that or is that on top? Is that something extra that doesn't really count as your academic curriculum? That's the first question. And then um, secondly is when do you need to decide your major? If you're undecided, um, when is the best time? And you know, like if you were maybe interested in psychology but you weren't decided now, like when do you really need to make a decision? Two questions, thank you. Um, PE classes are not credit bearing, um, so they do not add to your three and a half. Uh, I actually, and you can take one each quarter, so you two a semester. Um, all of your students will need to take six before they graduate. Um, I actually love, I love this part of Reed. Um, I wish I could take all of the PE classes that are offered to your students. Um, and I actually do really recommend them, especially in the first year. They're a really nice way to meet a different group of people um, and to sort of, um, yeah, practice uh, a different um, part of your brain and part of your body. Um, in terms of uh, the second question about declaring a major, does anybody else wanna take this one? Oh, and I'll add too that, yeah. you know, PE, requirement can also be um, fulfilled with community engagement as well. Yeah, thanks. So anyway. And Excel. That's new. Yeah, in Excel. Uh, yeah. I'll, I'll talk a little bit. So we have, uh, th there, as part of the six credits for PE, we have a new thing that can come into it. There's a community engagement, which has been in place for a while, but also now um, internship opportunities that can be construed as part of, of the learning. Uh, there, through the Center for Life Beyond Read, now you can apply to use those to receive credit for PE. Not all six units of PE can be completed this way, but uh, I think at most two of them. And this is brand new, so we're still all learning how that works. Um, regarding the question about when to declare a major, students have to declare their major uh, by their sophomore year, by the end of their sophomore year. Uh, and many students really take their time until then to, to figure it out. And one of the important conversations to have as an advisor with a student who's undecided is how to craft those first two years so that they can really lead to the student being able to follow whatever path they end up deciding uh, to follow. Going through the course catalog, uh, and this coming, people talk about workload and everything, but if a student interested in the dual major, it didn't look like there was an obvious way to find that path. 
lots of classes, and I think those professors might be on sabbatical or other attrition, are not available. At just a cursory count is north of 35. Uh, so I'm just trying to understand how the dynamics play out. This is just what is visible for 2022, 2023. But that was just a reflection of, it may be different in the four subsequent years. So I was not able to comprehend from this course catalog if somebody's looking, what, how do you navigate that? Um, I, I can answer this question in part. I, I teach in the history department. Um, we never offer the same class two years in a row. Um, so I might be particularly well, well poised to answer this. Uh, so I would, you know, all of our departments are, uh, you know, small compared to like a research one university, right? Um, and we're trying to both uh, meet students' needs in terms of providing uh, a path through the major, right? Making sure that uh, there's enough intro level courses and also provide enough variety for students as they make their way through. Um, so, you know, I would say, we tend to think about things on sort of a two or a three year plan. So I will offer a class now that probably won't be offered again uh, until the student's fourth year. Um, so if there is like one class that a student is most enthusiastic about, uh, it might be worth talking with that professor to see when that class will be offered. Um, that being said, I think departments have uh, been really thoughtful about making sure that each year they're providing um, all the things that need to be provided. And it might be that, you know, I sometimes teach a class called Crisis and Catastrophe. It's a great class. I, it's really fun. Um, but if a student doesn't actually get to take that class, there are themes from that course that will show up in other courses that I might teach that could sort of fill that same, that same need for them. So all of, I guess that's just a very long way of saying there's a thoughtfulness across departments to make sure that both that stability and that variety are created, um, even if we don't have 20 or 30 historians um, available uh, to, teach, to teach your students. Is there anything else you'd add? Yeah, yeah I mean, I just wanna, I mean, there, there, the classes that are required for the major, those are taught regularly, and then there's upper level electives that like, for example, in the math department, the way our requirements work, you need to take three out of this 300 level classes, we don't care which ones you take. So those, we alternate. We don't teach them every year because we wanna err on the side of like having a bigger variety of those as opposed to like teaching each of those every year because we don't have the bandwidth as, as Mary was saying. So um, I would assume that most of the students or a lot of the students that you have coming in as freshmen have been in environments where um, they have a hard time connecting with other students and where they haven't had a lot of opportunity to need to study very hard. <laughs> My kid has a lot of uh, what most people call extracurricular activities that are pretty academic and I don't think he's understanding how little time he will have <laughs> for those kinds of things. Is, am I correct in those assumptions? You see that a lot. A lot of students will come in planning to do things in the area that are, are maybe um, in their field of interest and they need to pair back. Do they tend to recognize that by October so that they don't mm -hmm. fail their classes? How do, how, what do you see in those kinds of ways with your incoming students who have maybe not been in the most academically rigorous environments coming in. Meg, do you have any thoughts on this? Before? Yeah, I, I guess I would say um, I really encourage students to, to get enough sleep. I don't know if you read the New York Times this week, but New York Times this week, you know, 35 minutes of sleep can make a difference. Okay. Um, get enough sleep is huge have regular sleeping hours, you know, eat healthfully, get, you know, get exer you know, get outside or whatever. Um, all those things are really important and probably like talked about not enough. Um, so I really encourage that. And if there's extracurriculars that are, you know, making you feel like you're a more vibrant student, do those. 
I don't think that there's going to be a problem with the student recognizing how much work they have. They'll, they'll show up the first week and they'll feel pretty clear about that. So I don't, I, I don't know. I've never had anybody think like, wow, I have all this extra time. Um, so I don't know if this is, a, maybe other people have heard this as a common problem. I think it's more encouraging, I think if the pressure has to be somewhere, it's encouraging students to do a little bit more kind of vitality creating activities outside of academics than to make sure they do more academics. So I think you're gonna be okay. My kids are homeschooled and so they've done tons of that. And I don't think that he's recognizing that this school will keep him busy academically. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And so I'm wondering if the, if the advisor, is there an adult who's paying attention to what's happening? I mean, he's doing condor propagation with the World Peregrine Fund. He, you know, mm -hmm, he wants mm -hmm. you to work in the condor propagation at the zoo near here. Uh -huh. That's just going to be a lot. Yeah. And he also wants four classes. And well, so I'm wondering, is somebody paying attention to that who's going to help him titrate what he can handle? I mean, advisors get comments from professors with a good deal of frequency. And we try to meet with students, especially first-year students, um, throughout the semester. So there are guardrails to you know, ensure that your student is um, being kind of aided in their, in their progress. But it's worth you know, encouraging your students also to reach out themselves, because they're the ones who know best in some ways what they need. And maybe I should, I, I have had students like that, that like, for, like first week, they just want to sign up for every possible thing that is not academic. And some listen to me when I tell them not to do that, and some don't. And, and then, then when fourth week comments come along, we realize, oh, so maybe you need to cut down on something because your academics are suffering. And, and this, is, this is what Meg is talking about, that like, we do have a system set up that hopefully can catch if a student is not really like, doing as, as well as they could in, in their classes. But sometimes, like, I mean, as, as much as we have this, uh, sometimes these things fall through the cracks. So as much as, I mean, I know you guys want to let your kids go uh, a little bit, but, but keep an eye on that too. So just make sure that like they are keeping um, track of their academics uh, at, at the same time. Um, we've had a, a question in the blue mask for a little bit. Are you, do you still have that question? Colby, back, back here. Yeah. Hi. Uh, my question, and I don't know if it would really apply to first year students, but in looking at the English department um, list of classes, everything seemed to be analysis based, and I didn't see any kind of creative writing. So th my question is, is that offered, and if it's not, do teachers ever, or, or can a student ever uh, request to learn something and create a class around that? Um, so there is creative writing offered. Um, it probably shows up under CRWR instead of under English. Um, so there are creative writing classes offered in the short story, personal essay, poetry, um, and long form fiction. And some of our English students will actually write theses that are also creative theses. Um, so that is an option. Uh, in terms of creating your own class, any thoughts on this? Uh, I actually just uh, worked with a student that, and this maybe speaks to this question about um, which courses are available at you know, which times. Um, there was a, a, a hiccup in sort of hiring and stuff, and so one of our upper level music theory classes wasn't being offered this term. So this student reached out to me over the summer to work out an independent study proposal to do a choral composition course that would cover some of these topics, but in a create through a sort of a creative outlet also, um, and so over the summer we we met a little bit and um, divvied up some work and submitted a proposal for an uh, independent study course in the spring. So these these are mechanisms that students can also um, um, go through to get what they want. Yeah. CRWR was what you mentioned. Yeah, and I just check. For example, in the fall, there's five classes in creative writing being offered. So we probably just weren't looking in the right place. Yeah. yeah. All right. Great. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks for taking the time to answer our questions. Um, I have two questions about the humanities course. Um, one is just like 
can you kind of describe a week in the life of the humanities core? Like pick whatever part of the year you think would be a good time to kind of illustrate that, um, just in case we don't get the details later on from our student. <laughs> and, and, and second, can you talk a little bit about how you see that class kind of connecting up with stuff that happens later for the next three years, like how it influences how the students think or how you see it, like how does it show up with people who do end up doing math or something like that. There's ways that it kind of, you know, uh, perpetuates through the next three years. Meg, you want to so take the first? I can take this yeah. because I teach in that course. So maybe we'll start with the first week. Um, they're going to start with Gilgamesh and they're going to, they're going to view three lectures through video format. Um, one for each kind of class period, or if they meet twice a week, then it's slightly off kilter from the exact lectures, but that's a detail. Um, and then they will come to their conference setting for either three class periods of 50 minutes or two class periods of an hour and 20 minutes. And I'll just say what I do. Um, I usually have students pair with each other and come up with a set of questions that they're excited to talk about for that class period. And, um, and then they present those. So everybody hears what all the questions are. And then I, I kind of select some that I think are the most fruitful for the discussion. And, we, and we, then we take off. Um, and we might come back around to some of the other questions, or we might bring together a few questions and weave them in um, in kind of fruitful ways. But essentially, we're going to be discussing this text beginning with some seeds from the lectures they've all viewed and intersecting those with whatever interests they have in the text, whatever they've noticed. And what happens is students start reading with an eye to this. Um, if you read a text and think, when I come to class, I'm going to be asking questions, engaging in other people's questions, you're reading with a really vibrant sense of I need to be able to, you know, engage with people on this. It really makes you read differently and it makes you approach everything in a completely, um, with a completely different mindset, with a kind of sense of exciting urgency. Um, so it's not the kind of reading you do like as you're falling asleep. It's the reading you're doing like sitting up at a desk, ready to go, okay? Um, and then what happens is in the course, I guess our first paper comes pretty early in the semester and they will have an opportunity to come to my office hours, for instance, to talk with me about some of their ideas for the paper. Um, and we might do some low stakes writing assignments and they'll get you know, feedback from me before the actual paper is due. So, um, and I'll walk with them through, you know, what are the stages of writing a paper for a class like this? This is not an AP class. And that's what a lot of them, you know, have experienced. And as, as a parent of a rising senior, I know what those AP classes look like. This is totally, you know, in some ways fresh and new and honestly really exciting. So they have an opportunity to really, um, you know, do some truly intellectual work in this class. And I try to help them see what that looks like. Um, and then after they write the paper, they come and talk with me for 20 minutes. Uh, and they, like I said, they get their written feedback, but then they, we also have an opportunity. And I always begin with, what did you think about your paper? Because at the end of the day, and this goes to this point about like, how does this class relate to the rest of their education? Ultimately, I'm not gonna be there after every paper to um, you know, tell them what my feedback is. So I want them, one of, the, one of the goals is for them to get better and better and better at critiquing their own work. And so that's something that I really look for. So by the end of the year, ideally, we, when they come to these conversations, they're the ones who are telling me, this is what I should have done. Um, and then I'm kind of helping shape that kind of self-critique. And I encourage students to actually write their own comments on their paper um, so that we can kind of see, do they match with mine or what have you. So that's just a little glimpse into what um, Humanities 110 is doing. And ultimately, they are going to be writing a thesis where with each draft, ideally, they're able to kind of self-critique before they even give it to me um, so that I can kind of push them farther and farther along. Um, so that's just a little glimpse. Shohei or Angelica, do either of you have a 
a response, and I think quickly, because we're running a little bit low on time, as to how this might show up in something that is not a humanities field. I, one way in which I see it in my classroom is just the way that students talk to each other when they're working together, like the, the level of respect and of really listening to each other's ideas. I think that's something that they definitely get from, from the conference in, in HUM 110. And I guess I would say um, uh, sometimes it shows up in like repertoire selection, like what pieces we perform, and they'll kind of apply, um, whether it's through Hume classes, particularly in the second semester, or other classes where they have some reading that's allowing them to think critically about sort of the ethics of which pieces we perform. Um, they'll bring that to the rehearsal and they'll, you know, we'll listen to the pieces and they'll maybe question like, you know, is it, us that should be telling these stories, and and I, I just love the sort of um, the way that the sort of their critical minds like show up in the in the rehearsal process too. So, um, I think we have time for maybe one more question. And this uh, one, this person in the back corner here has had a question for a while too. I think so. Maybe two quick yeah. questions. <laughs> Mine are pretty quick. Um, one is the Hume One Ten. It looks like it's going to be virtual. The lecture is that. Are there any plans to bring that back into? to uh, in-person learning? Um, yes, I think we're doing it for this year. It was a kind of pandemic um, shift, but we, I mean, I I'll just say personally, I hope that we're able to go back to an in-person format for next year. Um, we did find that uh, some students reported higher engagement because they were able to actually re-watch things. And so um, there's currently basically a discussion going on as to whether it's better for our students to have it online and replayable or in person. Maybe there was one both. other. I, I just have one more little question. For the group one, two, three requirements that you have, um, do those, if somebody takes something from group one that's also required and meets a major requirement, do those double up? Okay, okay, thank you. And then one last one I think in the back. Thank you. Uh, we haven't heard much discussion about the role of AP courses or community college courses that our students may have come in with already and what, how you, the advising process would recognize that, whether those credits would apply to fill major requirements. So maybe uh, you could touch upon that because some of our students have quite a bit, but I have a feeling not all of it's necessarily gonna count towards their major. So not everything counts, but a lot does. Uh, and a lot of it depends department to department. So I can tell you, I do that job for the math department. And we have very specific rules about AP calculus. If you got a four in the AB or a five in the B, I can't even remember. I, do it, I have to check every time because I did not grow up in this country, so I do not understand AP. Um, <laughs> But, but I, I, have a, I have a cheat sheet that allows me to do this every time. If you go to the registrar's website, you will actually find very specific information about AP, what receives credit, what doesn't receive credit. So, so I can tell you, calculus receives credit, but statistics doesn't, and it just depends. And for example, calculus, it means that you don't have to take calculus at read, but in others, you might receive credit, but you, you, sh you are still encouraged to take the class at read. Like, it really depends department to department. And similar with the, the, the community college credits that they might have, it's really there's, in every department, there's one person in charge to figure out whether a specific class from a specific college should receive credit at read or not, how much credit should it receive, should it replace a class at read, should it count for major requirements and so. So it's really a department to department kind of decision. Well, the registrar's office gets all of these transcripts and they, they communicate with the person in charge of every department. And usually these things, I mean, they're kind of happening as we speak, uh, but sometimes like the transcript doesn't get in until sometime in September and then the conversation happens then. Do you have time for one final? Sure, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, so academic rigor, read, yes. But um, the academic load, it's comprised of, of reading and lectures, consuming information from outside. And then it's also comprised of discussion and writing and generating new content. I realize this is gonna vary wildly by class, but just 
overall, how would you characterize the proportion of the academic load? Soaking it in or generating new? How, just if you could speak to that. I can speak in my classes. I would say it's 98% generating new, 2% soaking it up. And in my classes, it varies widely. So this class that I'm teaching this semester is probably 20% soaking up, 80% producing your own. But sometimes I'm teaching a class where we have to learn a lot of new content. And so it may be going to look more like maybe 50-50 or 60-40. Or it really depends. These are also maybe two not mutually exclusive categories, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think like what we know about learning is that it happens best when you're doing it in the way that Angelica was describing at the beginning, right? Um, and so even ideally soaking it up in a lecture, quote unquote, right, um, involves some active processes. And I think that's one of the things Meg was pointing towards, right? When you're reading or when you're listening to a lecture, you're an active and engaged person and participant within that. Um, mm -hmm. Likewise, when there's a discussion going on around you and all of your student, all of your colleagues or classmates are contributing, if you're not treating that as a moment to soak it up, you're missing out on something really crucial at Reed, right? So, um, you know, I think like in my classes, it's, it really is, it's 98% discussion, but I hope that they're retaining some things and taking things from that as well, just as I hope that when they go to a Hume lecture, um, they're doing some active generation and cr developing critiques and their own ideas um, as they move from that. Um, I think that's probably about the last of our um, questions. We wanted to get you all out of here at 150 and it's 153. Um, I'll just say a couple of things by way of, of wrapping up. Um, the first is a huge thank you um, to my fellow panelists. Um, I find chatting with faculty about what they're doing in their classrooms to be the most engaging and enjoyable pastime. I'm constantly inspired by what your students' professors are doing. Um, and I encourage you to ask your students about that. Um, but I think uh, being able to ask questions like, what are you excited about? What's going on in your classroom? Um, what are you learning? Um, those are great ways uh, to help your student connect uh, with what's going on here and um, the kinds of questions that you're asking. Um, I'll also say thank you to you. It's clear you all care very deeply uh, about your students. Um, they are in good hands. Uh, those of us who teach in Hume 110 uh, will be really excited to welcome them um, next week. Uh, and I'll just finally say um, I will be available for questions for a couple of minutes afterwards. So if any of you have follow-ups, you're welcome to reach out to me. Um, and also uh, to send me an email um, through the Center for Teaching and Learning um, if any of you have follow-up questions. Anything else you all might add? Thank, right. oh, thank you. Thank, thank you, you for, for sending out to your students.